the subtitle of my book is Mistakes, Miracles, and Lessons from the Love Sack Story. That's a good subtitle. Yeah, right? Because um, you know, we, we, we make mistakes along the way, right? And, uh, and because I ended up, I started writing. That's the 25 years you're going to save the mistakes. That you're t- <laughs> exactly. Mistakes. My hope is like I can save you a chunk of your 25 year journey. Not you, but you know, someone else. Welcome to the Let Me Save You 25 Years podcast, not just another interview podcast. Instead, we jump right into a new Seanism each week. Each one of these is a lesson I've learned usually the hard way along the way in hopes that you can maybe learn from my mistakes and build great things even bigger, better, faster than I ever did, perhaps shaving a decade or two off your own journey to success. These are simply true principles and useful tactics for success in life, not just business, unpacked in great depth by extremely successful people each week. My book also called Let Me Save You 25 Years, where today's topic comes from, is intentionally very short. So think of this as the long version where I can go even deeper into topics. And I'm so excited about the insights from today's special guest, founder of Whole Foods, now a serial entrepreneur with a new concept called Love Life, Mr. John Mackey, and what he has to add to our topic today. Seanism number 12, play along the way. Okay, quick story from my own life about play along the way and really a turning point I experienced at a young age. I'm 19 years old, living in Taiwan as a missionary for my church, uh, speaking Mandarin Chinese. I'm only a few months in and I have just worked around the clock to develop really good Chinese really quickly. And the way that I did that was waking up, you know, an hour earlier than even the prescribed, you know, kind of wake up time at, I think six 30 in the morning, I was waking up at five 30 doing an extra hour wrapped up in a blanket, studying characters, every seam and crack, as we've said on other episodes that I could find in my life, I was memorizing Chinese characters, even riding my bike sometimes with no hands flipping through flashcards Um, you know, and any moment I could get away from teaching lessons to people or, or doing meetings in people's homes, all the things that we did as missionary service, tons of service, painting, whatever we, whatever we were up to as, as missionaries helping out, I was in the corner somewhere refining my Chinese, memorizing phrases, uh, memorizing characters, whatever. And we're hanging out in the foyer of the church one day, waiting for an appointment to show up. And and we run around in pairs as missionaries. And we were actually there with a bunch of missionaries hanging out with some members who were just kind of lingering around the chapel in Taiwan. And, um, and I was over in the corner looking at my flashcards. And I remember this, this uh, like gregarious, happy, outgoing member named Candy came over and said, you know, Nelson, are, are you okay? And I looked up from my flashcards and I said, yeah. Well, why? What's up? And, um, and she said this in Chinese, you know, well, she said, because I never see you smile. And for me, this is like a needle off the record moment, because if you know anything about me, I grew up like the life of the party, uh, tons of just crazy events after crazy events in my life. I mean, friends, exciting times, cars, sports, like, I don't know. I just feel like I had a, I tried to have a good time even as I was, a, a, you know, a straight A student actually, but I, I, I worked really hard, played really hard. And I was, felt like I was known for that. And here someone was like, I never see you smile. And from that moment, I realized, you know, I need to put away these flashcards when I'm around other people. I need to engage. I need to be with the people that I'm with. I need to uh, focus on them, not be so task-oriented. And I continued to learn my Chinese in the seams and cracks when no one was around and and, and whatnot. But, but I made this big change in my life. And, and more so, I also made a commitment to have more fun. And, and, and thankfully this happened kind of early on my mission, because from that moment, a few months in, when I began to just have more fun, 
goof around with, uh, you know, members of the church, non-members of the church, people that I met, um, I became a better missionary. I became uh, a lot more likable. I became, and I had a lot more fun and the time went faster and it was awesome. And I still learned Chinese and I came home fluent and all these other things. So through the good times, through the bad times, through the hard times, through the thick times, play along the way, or you might just grow old doing whatever it is you're doing. And uh, we unpack it in great depths with our amazing guest today um, who sold this company to Amazon for billions and billions and uh, has employed tens of millions of people. So proud to have his expertise on the pod, Mr. John Mackey talking about play along the way. This week on the pod, we welcome a modern day business Titan who is truly one of a kind amongst Titans. Coming up earlier in days of modern vegetarianism, environmentalism, and entrepreneurship, he built a retail chain big enough and strong enough to first go public and then be sought out by Amazon. I am sitting here with the 40 plus year CEO and founder of Whole Foods Market revolutionized, uh, who revolutionized more than just retail or grocery, but its success and breadth helped foment numerous movements simultaneously. Health, wellness, organic foods, conscious operations, and many other, what I would call, positive movements in business and culture can be tied back to Whole Foods Market and the way it does business. Co-author of Conscious Capitalism, a book that has long been one of only three required readings inside my own company, Lovesack, that is in itself a movement as we get the chance to sit here together in person at the annual Conscious Capitalism CEO Conference Summit that is here in Austin, Texas. I'm excited and honored to be sitting here live to discuss the idea uh, with a legend and a business leader who I am sure has found a way to do exactly that, play along the way over many decades as he scaled into the many billions, Mr. John Mackey. Hey, Sean, thanks for having me on. <laughs> Great to be with you. All right, John, so when you got the uh, memo that we're gonna be chatting on this topic, play along the way, what was the first thing that came to mind? Well, you gave me a choice of two topics, okay. and this was the one that I really wanted to do because I am totally into play. Awesome. Play is, uh, I've, I've, I'm still playing in, mm -hmm. in, in almost every way in my life. I think I don't just play along the way, I just try to turn everything into play, awesome. try to gamify everything. Hmm. So give me an example. Um, well, uh, for example, let's take, uh, let's take my health. So, um, uh, got an Apple watch Yeah. and about now it's been about almost two years ago, I stopped drinking alcohol hmm. and why? Because this was tracking my sleep and I began to notice, well, why did I sleep well this night? And I had deep sleep on Tuesday, but not so good on Wednesday. What's different about that day? And there were many factors. The amount of exercise that you get has a big impact on your sleep. The more exercise you do, the, the longer and deeper you sleep. But I also discovered that alcohol would short circuit my sleep. Hmm. So that it's like, oh wow, if I drink even just one glass of wine, my deep sleep would go to zero. Hmm. My, my length of sleep would drop about an hour from say, seven and a half to six and a half and my pulse rate would go up about eight eight beats from about 48 to about 56 so it was like and then i could i test it over time it's like this is really this really happens mm -hmm. so then i just stopped drinking and i started sleeping better and mm. I, I i don't know i'll probably drink again sometime or another but i i ask myself the question all the time would i rather sleep well tonight mm. or um uh, get a good night's sleep well I, to me that's a form of play because wow. I'm playing in a sense with my my body and my well-being and I've got I'm tracking myself I'm scoring myself I'm measuring it I'm monitoring it and uh, so I've since I've gamified my sleep in a certain to a certain extent and I'm by the way I'm not done with it I'm constantly studying it sort of observing and uh, uh, other examples are um, in business I'm always my attitude is to be perpetually in a playful mode because when you're playful, you're creative. And then part of play is kind of doing the things that you care about, the things that are fun. I like having fun. And, and having fun is, if something's boring, well, I just don't do it. I mean, I, I always like to tell the story that 
in college, I, I had like a 120 hours of electives. Hmm. I only took courses I was interested in. Cool. If I didn't like a class, I dropped it. Yeah. And I audited classes and didn't even, you know, just because I was interested in them and it didn't even try to get, you know, do, didn't even do it pass fail or try to get credit for it because it was fun. It was fun to learn. And so mm -hmm. if it wasn't fun, I stopped doing it. Yeah. When it was fun, I did it. And, and I sort of, and business for me has always been fun. Creating a, if there's something more fun than building a business, I haven't discovered it yet. It's very difficult. It takes, you have to learn and you have to know people and, and you have to, you'll make a ton of mistakes and you have to, uh, and, and it's, it's endlessly challenging, but it's so rewarding. It's, it's, it's just it's so, you develop these deep relationships with people and you're you're going through these challenges mm -hmm. and struggles together and you bond it it's like marines in a in a in a foxhole you're bonding together because you're because you're you're meeting these challenges and you're failing sometimes and succeeding others and there's just a depth to it yeah that, and there's a playfulness to it because and i think i bring that i bring that attitude of play with me at work and that helps enliven other people yeah because they can feel my playful energy and that makes them relax and and have a good time this is so good man so much to unpack here where do i begin so so a few observations my, first of all a, a guess so i'm guessing as much as it probably feels great to uh i don't know have a change in your life you probably miss operating whole foods the way you did for well, so I, long you have to understand that um um, I did retire from Whole Foods, but I've started up another business. Yeah. So I'm, I'm. Tell us about it. Well, I'm back in startup mode. Yeah. And and it's called Love Life. Yeah. And think of it as like my elevator pitch is think of it as a going to open a chain of not natural food stores, but a chain of one stop health and wellness centers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we'll have a healthy restaurant. Our first big location is going to open in the L.A. area, in in El Segundo down in Beach Cities. Yeah. And we're taking over an old Best Buy. Happens to be in a center where there's a Whole Foods market. Mm -hmm. That's not a coincidence. Yeah. Uh, it's a very successful Whole Foods market. So this this is on the Pacific Coast Highway. So we've got great visibility, great parking. You know, uh, it's a good location. And then we we have this healthy restaurant. We have a gym. We have got so we've got workout weights. We've got aerobic equipment. You've got what you get. You know, a typical Equinox gym or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yoga. Pilates. We got three indoor pickleball courts, and uh, we've got a spa, and we'll have a variety of different healing modalities from recovery things, from um, cryotherapy to IVs to um, infrared saunas. Then we'll have, um, but then the medical parts. The thing that really is revolutionary, because you know my vision is is that you should begin a relationship with a doctor. Doctor's more of a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, a lifestyle dietary wellness coach. Now, there are doctors that are trained in that. There are medical doctors that are actually specialized in this area, and those that's who we'll be working with primarily. Cool. So that the whole idea is that if you track yourself, if you first you get a good assessment of where you are. So let's say you became a member. Yeah. And we would want you to do as much as you'd be willing to get tested to get your baseline established. And then the doctor plus a coach would begin working with you to optimize your health at the highest level. How can we get a, a healthier version of Sean? Yeah. And, but That's then cool. health is not just physical health. There's a psychological, emotional, and spiritual component to it as mm -hmm. well. So we'll be doing things like breath work. When psychedelic therapy is legal, we'll be doing mm -hmm. things like that. Um, we, will, we will have meditation. And you know, I already mentioned yoga and Pilates and things like that. So this whole idea that you're on a health journey and we're gonna make it as rewarding as possible. And the whole idea, you'll be seeing a doctor, so paradoxically, you don't have to see a doctor. Yeah, The doctor's there to help you optimize your health, be at the highest degree of wellness, your, your immune system to be as strong as possible. So that, you know, the honest truth is I just turned 70 years old. Yeah. And I weigh the same as I weighed when I was in high school. Uh, I, I, I don't. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, super healthy my vit vitality is very high mm -hmm. i have a very strong immune system i almost never get sick um yeah i mean i i i my peers are starting to fall off but yeah. i am dedicated to this Heck healthy yeah. lifestyle and and playfulness and positive attitude and i feel like i'm in, i'm sort of super 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 healthy right now okay so first of all 
my only health concern for you then would be when the cartels of big pharma and you know health healthcare come after you for short circuiting their uh, their agenda. Well, it's going to take it's going <laughs> to you know I when I read Simon Sinek's book a few years ago called um, The Infinite Game, yeah. which was a kind of a follow up on a book written decades before by uh, uh, Jim Carr's called The Infinite Game, um, that. And I thought, you know, that's what I was doing with Whole Foods. I was playing an infinite game. Yeah. Love life is another infinite game. Yeah. It's going to outlive me. And the pharma companies, I hope, will be disintermediate, dis, disintermediated, but it's going to take decades Absolutely. to do that, right? So we're, it's not like we're going to open up and it's like, at last, love yeah. life's here. No, we'll have to build this chain out over hopefully faster than we built Whole Foods. But yeah. it'll, take us, it'll take us a while to get the physical locations up and running. Yeah. So no, I listen. I, I concur. I mean, uh, this this is what I was alluding to with my ambitions for Love Sack. As unlikely as our come up was, even though we share the most powerful word in the universe now as our moniker, love. Mine was accidental. Right. I just sack. needed a you hippie. Were, you were ahead of your time. Well, I you know I stumbled into it, John. Honestly, like where you've got to be intentional about it. You've had this whole career that's now focused into this new op opportunity that you like you stumbled your way into an infinite loop i i tripped my way into an inf, what's becoming now i think an infinite game with love sack and and isn't it cool that both of us share that you know i don't moniker. i'm a, i'm the kind of guy in my spiritual worldview that's not an accident mm. we're we're all called to a hero's journey mm. it's just that most people don't answer the call <laughs> and we did and so once you begin to follow that mm. inner guidance, that heart, the heart space that leads you, um, your life begins to unfold and emerge it in this amazing, true. amazing way. It is so true. Oh my gosh. So, okay. So let me back up for a second here. There's so many fascinating things about what you've just thrown at me to be right out of the gate. So I find it fascinating that, you know, you're talking about tra tracking data, observing, studying as you're describing your own health as as like your version of playing <laughs> like that sounds like torture to me like here it's so cool to contrast because like i don't wear a tracking device in fact this watch i'm wearing doesn't even work it's a it's an analog it looks really cool it's a bracelet <laughs> essentially right that's all it is like the battery dies and i forget about it and i'm on the other end of the spectrum in that realm i don't drink because i was born and practice i'm a mormon Right. So I've never. I've, I, well, that's very fortunate. Well, I know. Right. So my point is, is like in so many ways we parallel, but coming at it from completely different points of views, completely different personalities. I'm, you know, where you are, obviously, I think, as you speak, if I may, you know, data obsessed. And that's probably been a big uh, hallmark of your success in business. And, you know, I, I'm obsessed with other things and I have people in my realm that are data. My, my point is, is I think there's not one path to succeeding at, let's call it the billion dollar level or succeeding in business or succeeding in life. Your personality, what you find play, I find torture. What I find play, you probably, you know, whatever. Well, give me an example of what you find play. Well, look, the reason I sleep well, how, you know, you know how I track my days that I sleep well? Did I, did, I, did I dirt bike this morning? Did I surf this morning? Did I, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. and from, and not that you don't do some, of those I do things. all those. I don't do those things, but yeah. I mean, I play, yeah. I play pickleball. Cool. I'm a long distance backpacker. I just got back from completing the Alpe Adria trail in wow. Europe. It's a 480 mile trail. Congrats. Um, and even now that I've started this new business up, I'm still, I'm still doing the activities that I love to do. Um, That's amazing. Uh, and, uh, and, and having fun. I love to play in almost any kind of game. Mm -hmm. I like I like to play games with kids. I like to, I, I play, I just like to play, period. Cool. But it, at some point in my book that I'm writing, that's coming out, uh, uh, the whole story, uh, My Adventures in Love, Life, and Capitalism, which will be out next uh, May, May 21st is pub date. Perfect. And I, I tell the story of Whole Foods and tell my own spiritual story, and, and they're, they're very much inter, inter, interconnected. And I talk a lot about play in the book because I do believe that I'm, we're in, I believe all life is an infinite game mm -hmm. and that we're on this infinite journey, all of us are. And, you know, the Hindus had a term for it, it's called, it called um, Lila. And Lila is divine play, mm -hmm. that the universe itself is divine play, that it's, it's 
the Big Bang has happened an infinite amount of times, and we incarnate, and we just, there's the, the one being exists forever and ever and ever, and um, uh, it's just, so enjoy yourself, play, cool. have fun. And, we're, and we're, however your heart calls you to do it, now our heart may call us in different ways, yeah. but answering the call of the heart, in, for me, is a for, form of play. Now, I do take my games very seriously, okay. so that's what people don't understand. Yeah. It's like, when I play, I play with a great intensity, yeah. but I am playing, and so like when the game's over, the game is over, but while I'm there, I'm focused on the game. You I'm play to win. I play to win, but I also play, I'm absorbed by it, and if I don't win, um, when I was younger, that used to drive me nuts, but, um, <laughs> and I'm getting older, so I lose a lot more on almost uh -huh. anything I do, okay. but the point is, is that now that, that that's not, a, my ego's not, there. I don't identify with winning as who I am. Yeah. So it's okay. In fact, losing is one of the best ways to learn. Yeah. And failure is one of the best ways to learn. So anyway, um, I take my games very seriously and I also take life very playfully. That's the paradox. Well, I mean, lessons on lessons inside of there. So, um, I have a, so, so let me, let me, let me take it this way. So outside of, so, um, let, let's shift for a second. So your personality and who you are and how you're wired, very different from mine, but we have a lot in common nonetheless, because, uh, you know, we're, we're both on some kind of journey. We've both adopted business as a form of expression and as a form, I mean, that's something I love about you know, conscious capitalism is, and, and I, I talk about this a lot, like in my, let me back up inside my own organization, even sometimes des the design for life philosophy can be uh, misconstrued as sustainability. And it's not, it, it leads to what I think is true sustainability mm -hmm. things, stuff that actually sustains. But um, what's my point? My point is, um, conscious capitalism is capitalism. Even though we're talking about all of these true principles, including, you know, four letter words like love, it's capitalism and, and design for life is capitalism. And what I mean by that is I believe in leveraging human beings, self-interest. Mm -hmm. If you can make it fun for them, if you can make it good for them, of course. beautiful for them, long lasting for them, useful for them, they will make that choice. It's not just about conning them into buying no, this thing or making to, the price so low that they must buy it. You have to create value for other people, but you have to know what people value in order to create value for them. And that, and people value different things. So mm -hmm. some people, would, the things that you just named, the reasons people might want to buy love sack, may be values that other people don't it, yeah. like at all. So the, the, you, you have to target your market in a sense to the people that, that want those things that you want to produce. The good news is, in both our cases, as we did the things that we cared about, there were a lot of other people that synced up with it. Yeah. And you don't need to win everyone. No, you like, don't. Like, uh, All love businesses life, are niche. Yeah. Love life won't appeal to everyone. No, it won't. But it will appeal to many. Enough to probably make you, you know, uh, uh, to probably take it into the billions again. I'll How about you, that? I'll tell you a story. So, um, Whole Foods was always, when we started out, we were just literally a bunch of hippies selling the food to other hippies. And I remember we raised venture capital money back in 1988. And that was, at that time, we only had six stores hmm. when we raised VC money. And that was very early. That's a new world for VC. It was. Consumer. That's, yeah. that's very astute observation. Mm -hmm. The VCs were not well developed back yep. then. And there, there was only one in Austin, a couple in Houston, and we only at not that many even in, in yeah. Sand Hill Road. Now we, people, you know, uh, Instagram about raising money. Yes, exactly. You know? Capital was scarce and hard to get and you, you didn't get it cheap. Yeah. It was, it, was cat, it, it was very valuable. So I remember we got turned down by these venture capitalists in Dallas and they were, um, they were named Philip and Smith and Don Phillips this was a different generation. These these people were my father's generation, and mm -hmm. I'm, they're, I'm sure they passed off the scene now because that's what 30, 12, 35 years ago. Mm. So if he was 60, he'd be 95 now. Anyway, uh, they turned us down, and you know, got to understand, Whole Foods was very successful with our six stores. We were doing about 50 million dollars a year in sales, and we we were making about a million dollars a year in profits, mm. and 
we shouldn't have had any trouble raising money, but most VCs turned us down. And I remember, for some reason, he felt like he needed to tell me why he wasn't going to invest. He says, sit down, boys. I want you to understand why I'm not investing. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I liken that to like, it's like you just got rejected <laughs> asking a girl out and she rejected you and now she wants to tell you why she didn't want to go out with you. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, you know, you rejected me. Yeah. You don't have to we tell got me the why. Point. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> got the point. So anyway, um, he says, ah, you know, you, you seem to have a nice little business. You know, you got, you're doing some sales. You got a lot of customers. You're making some money. Yeah, you're, you, you know, but... At the end of the day, I looked at all your customers, and you know they all look like you. They're all young, and they all got long hair, and you know a bunch of hippies. It's all a bunch of hippies. Mm. And 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 I, and he said, I just don't think that's a very big market. Mm -hmm. And I said, Well, the world's changing. The world is changing, and and you don't think it's a big market, but it could be a very big market in another ten years or so. Yeah. You know? And he said, Nah, I don't think it's ever going to be that big a market. I just I don't I think this hippie thing is a very temporary thing. And I said, Well, people's thinking. Not necessarily a temporary thing. And he said, yeah, but you know, John, even if I'm wrong and this catches on, there's no way you guys can compete with Safeway. Mm -hmm. They're going to run you out of business. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm doing you a favor telling you this stuff. So um, I ran into him in a conference 10 years later, <laughs> and he came up to me, and he I didn't recognize him. And he said, you know, John, i got to tell you, turning down that, telling, I remember he, he reminded me of the whole story. And I said, oh, yeah, you're the guy telling me why you don't want to go out with me. Right. <laughs> and, and he said, that was the biggest mistake I ever made as a venture capitalist because I was so wrong. So he, he, he had the um, integrity to admit he was wrong. So yeah. I, I admired him for that. But uh, I'm telling you that story because that that is kind of, you're always climbing this wall of skepticism as yeah. you build a business. People are forever telling you why you won't be successful. Yeah. Because the general attitude is, if it's a good idea, somebody would have already done it. Yeah. And it's like, it's a good idea because nobody's done it. Yeah. And Or and by the way, even if they already have done it. Maybe we can do it different and maybe we can do it better. That's right. Or to a different audience. And, and maybe you never built. Well, we were doing, think about it. We were in the grocery business. Yeah. So that's a pretty old business, been around a long time. We were just selling different food in a different way to different people. And, and by the way, the grocery business. you never even became the biggest, the biggest necessarily. The biggest what? Grocer. No, but we did become the biggest natural food store. That's company. right. My, my point and being- We're not even the biggest retailer of natural foods anymore because <laughs> we were so successful. Guess who's the biggest retailer of natural foods? I'm guessing Walmart. Absolutely. Yeah. Who's number two? Amazon. I mean, you're Amazon, but uh, Costco's not Costco, actually. Kind of, Am yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess Amazon Makes sense. now with us. I guess maybe Amazon and Whole Foods. We may be back to number one. Yeah. That, I, if that, I get to count Amazon. Yeah. Okay. There you go. <laughs> well, no, but but my point being, at what playing? First of all, everyone's so obsessed with bigness. And look, Whole Foods got plenty big, and Love Sack will get plenty big, but that's not even the point, right? No, never was the point. Never was the point. And like I said, the media is always asking me, do you ever think you could be that big? And the answer is no. Yeah. Initially, we just wanted to have one store that would be, uh, that could make money and yeah. we could earn a living and, and we'd sell healthy food to people. Yeah. And I started it, my girl, I was 24 and my girlfriend was 20. We didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> we'd, you know, she, we had a, we, in fact, the, the first store was called Safer Way. Mm -hmm. And it was in this big old Victorian house in, uh, on a street that had no retail traffic whatsoever. It was really zoned uh, for, um, mostly it was lawyers that were getting these kind of homes and putting their, putting their law offices there. And um, we, we had, it was vegetarian, because Renee and I were both vegetarian. We opened a vegetarian store. Yeah. And we called it Safer Way, Safe Way, Safer Way. And we, uh, we lived in the store, so we had the, Renee managed the, st the cafe, the vegetarian cafe. I managed the store, and then we, we had an office, and we slept on the, on the third floor. Yeah. And we did that for a couple of years. And we were having the time, we working our asses off, but having the time of our lives. It was so much fun. And uh, playing as you go. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, business, it, part of it's just the m mental framework you yeah. bring to it. If you yeah. bring, like I do, if you bring, it's like, you can you can play at any time. Yeah. You can just be driving along when you and <laughs> and you can just play little games. It's yeah. like you know, I I'm gonna play a game. Well, I see a main license plate yeah. in the next 50 cars. This is you know a game I might have done as a kid. That's probably not a game I do too much anymore. I've got <laughs> yeah. better games to play. But right. um, it's 
that it's that attitude that you bring. Yeah. And I just bring a playful attitude towards yeah, things. Yeah, you, you, you remind me, there was a year of my life where I had to make the drive between Salt Lake, which was where our little headquarters was. This is when I was in my 20s as well. And we had opened stores in California and I moved our factory with farm equipment and everything to Tijuana, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I made that drive 50 times. But on a few of those times and whenever I could, I either had a longboard skateboard in the trunk and even sometimes at dawn after a rough store opening, we would skate around in the parking lot, you know, just to not see our 20s evaporate without or, or, or find our way to the ocean and go surfing. That's how I learned to surf was in the in this the the seams and cracks between showroom you know, store openings and and factory working and whatever else it you know wherever I could because otherwise I would I would I was somehow cognizant that if I didn't do it I would wake up at, in my 40s and have missed it all yeah my 20s and my 30s because something as intense as the game of business especially at scale can suck you all in I totally understand that and and because I did. I was sucked in. I worked mm -hmm. really hard from, you know, I mean, I didn't really wake up from the, my, the type of work I was doing until mm -hmm. 2001. I was in New York City heading down to the, um, to the, to downtown when the Twin Towers were hit. Mm -hmm. And I remember we were in the car and the radio, entered the, we're listening to the radio and the guy comes in and says, well, Flash, uh, uh, a plane has run into, the, in, into one of the t Twin Towers. And our driver says, you know, something like that happened to the Empire State Building after World War II. That was actually true, that some hmm. plane ran into the Empire State Building. And so we didn't, oh, okay, I guess that happens in New York, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> it's just New York. And then the second one hit, oh. and uh, we, we were... we. We got out. We stopped our car. Got out. And we were all the all the debris was raining oh on our gosh. car. We we weren't going to go to the Twin Towers, but I'd been there plenty of times on other business meetings. So we could have been there. We were going to meet with the bond rating agencies, Moody's and Standard and Poor that morning, and and then I realized I got out the car and you could see both towers were on fire. Wow! And I thought immediately. I thought this cannot be an accident. New York is under attack. Yeah. We got to get the hell out of here because <laughs> this is an island. They're going to shut it down. Mm. And so my chief financial officer and I went, took right to the train station, got out, got to Philadelphia. Philadelphia rented a car and drove back to wow. Austin. But our investor relationship person, she'd planned the whole weekend to be in New York to go shopping and see friends and stuff. So she said, well, I just want to go back to the hotel. I got a big weekend plan. Oh and I said, Cindy, there wasn't going to be any weekend. Your weekend, weekend just got Your canceled. Weekend got canceled. She yeah. says, oh, John, this is New York. I said, those Twin Towers are on fire. This is not, I mean... She was she just couldn't believe it. Wow. So um, wow. she turned out she took her a week to get home because she couldn't get out right. of New York for a week. Anyway, that changed everything for me because it was like, holy shit, I could have been in there today and died. And, and do I want to look back on my life and all I did was do Whole Foods Market, which yeah, I'm proud of that. But mm -hmm. there are other things I wanted to do. So after that, I adopted, we'll say, I still worked hard, but I adopt, adopted a more adventuresome lifestyle to mm -hmm. do other things kind of on the bucket list, so to speak. I right. hiked the Appalachian Trail the next year, for yeah. example. Took a leave of absence for four and a half months. And, there you uh, go. Did that. Playing along the way. Exactly. Or you just Playing along the way, baby. I love it. Wow. I didn't know this part of you, and it's so, it's so fun to hear. And, and, you know, not surprising in the sense that, like you said, you know, you and I are very different people, actually. On, you keep saying that. On, I haven't said that. On, I don't I'm saying it. I'm saying it because I've studied you more than you've studied me, right? Like, I know more about you probably because I've read more and, and this and that just because, you know, you've, I've looked up to you for a long time. But we, we're both entrepreneurs, brother. Yeah. And entrepreneurs, we both have a playful attitude towards yeah. life. And we're creative. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're following our own destiny, our following our own heart. The most important, and we're both mission-driven. Dr yeah. And... Probably we've made a lot of the same dis discoveries about yeah. what's important in life. Yes, there are differences. I mean, hey, I'm 23 years older than you, so that's a yeah. difference right there. Yeah. But there's, if, if, if we were to take an inventory of things that we have in common versus things that are different, I think you'd be surprised how many things we have in common. Fair. And, and that's my point, really, is that these common threads, as I've, as I've done this podcast, do not surprise me because the factors and traits and formulas that lead to success however you want to define it are similar 
and and that and, and my only point in, in in my in calling out that we're different people is to make the point that it doesn't matter where you're from, kids, no kids, old, young, early, late, industry to industry, you can find success by following true principles. You know, your your background, my background, religion, beliefs, it doesn't matter. You know, but the principles are the same. And that's what's so fascinating. And so to shift gears for one more second, uh, just to, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, for people that aren't entrepreneurs or business leaders or CEOs of public companies or whatever, you know, for, for anyone, how, is, is it any different? Is the concept of play along the way, should it be thought of and perceived any differently? And how, do, how, might, how might someone who is not in, in the position you and I find ourselves in, where we have in some ways more flexibility, in some ways less, in some ways we have more demands on our time, in some ways we're in more control of our time. How, how might, what advice might you give someone who doesn't have your same position, let's say, uh, when it comes to play along the way? I mean, play along the way is, is it's a mental attitude. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, I mean, some people really don't like to play. They're, just, <laughs> they're not into that. They're yeah. sort of, you know, it's what kids would call like a grump, you know? Uh, and uh, <laughs> so I'm not sure play is for everyone. Okay. But uh, it definitely is for me, and it sounds like it's for you as well. Mm. I will say that play, play is whatever you enjoy doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and, and what's fun. I mean, other people, things that I might think are fun, you might not think are fun. Yeah, like tracking our, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't want to track my sleep. I just want to sleep. Wake I, up and go party more. I just want to sleep better. Yeah. So I'm, I'm constantly sort of like it's continuous self-improvement. Yeah, but you find joy in that is the point. And that's cool. Because when I discover uh, something that helps me sleep better or that I, you know, it's, 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 it's like a puzzle. Mm-hmm. I'm putting together a puzzle. The puzzle is myself. Yeah. And as I figure out, it, you know, it's like, as I figure out a new part that makes my life a little bit better, yeah. then that creates a little bit of joy. But it could me. be easy for someone that's wired like that to assume that others think that way too. And, my, and that's my point is like, you've been at least self-aware enough to identify the things that make you happy you know, whether others agree, that it, whether they're exciting or boring or whatever, and lean into those things. Absolutely. And it starts with self-awareness. That's personally, I mean, a big reveal. I talk about this in my book is like, I've been asked as you probably have a hundred times, like what's the secret to success? And personally, my answer to that question all the way back since I read Daniel Goleman in the early 2000s was self-awareness. That's underpins it all for me. Because if you can, if you can have an honest dialogue with yourself, it will lead you to all the right answers regardless of what other people think of those answers. I mean, I agree. And I feel like I'm very self-aware. Yeah. And, and uh, that also may, 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 I've been self-aware of things that I'm good at. And I'm also self-aware of things I'm not good at. Yes. And I, then I've been able, that's one of the secrets to my success is that success in business is always going to be, the media calls out certain people as sort of geniuses, you know, Elon Musk. <laughs> right, and right. Steve, you. No, sure. Steve, Steve Jobs and, and uh, these, these are unique individuals that have these, they're geniuses and blah, 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 blah. And certainly, you know, those guys are brilliant guys. However, it's the team that ultimately leads to success. And part of the secret to building a good team is self-awareness, mm. knowing that, you know, I, in my case, I'm very creative I'm very big picture guy. I am very good at um, uh, seeing how things can fit together. Also pretty good at inspiring, and I'm evangelical, I can inspire other people. Uh, other things I'm not so good at. I'm not really good at day-to-day details. Mm-hmm. It's boring to me. Usually you find watches boring. Yeah. I find all the, all the details for operations to be important and necessary, mm-hmm. but fundamentally not that interesting to me personally. Yes. So I, I'm, a, I'm self-aware about that. So I make sure that there are people on the team that are really good on those things, yep. really good, and empower them so yep. that I'm not second-guessing them on their, on their operations decisions. And then together, we form a dynam, dynamite team. That's right. So no self-awareness. And I, I, I've seen this take down many entrepreneurs who otherwise would have been successful totally they lack the self-awareness to know that what their weaknesses are and their ego gets out and in you front pair of that with the ego it requires to be 
yes. a brazen entrepreneur. Yes. Because you need ego yes. to power through. And so, and it's a deadly cocktail. And I lived it until I woke up to it. Hence the subtitle of the book, Mistakes and Miracles uh, from the Love Sack Story. And, uh, and of course, today I'm, I, I'm the same as you in the sense that I've got a team that's just better than me. Like I've got operators who are just way better than I am in those realms. End of story. Even though I think I'm good at a lot of things. Maybe that's the beginning of the story because mm -hmm. together the right. story continues on. It's not the end of the story. It's Fair. the beginning of the story <laughs> or, or it's, it's the infinite game. Now. Well, it was the beginning of definitely our, our now trajectory of, of pretty of super success. sustained success. Yeah. Exactly. And so, oh man, lots to learn. I mean, and, and from the topic of play along the way, here we are down into operations. How cool is that? Pretty cool. I mean, um, I try to make work fun for other people too. I mean, I, 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 I've never called it this, but I always want to have people on the team that, that like to organize fun things to do. Mm -hmm. So you're almost like a, a director of play, mm -hmm. somebody that, and you know, I'm on the board for the Motley Fool and they're, mm -hmm. they're big participants in conscious yeah. capitalism. And I mean, talk about a company dedicated to fun and play. Mm -hmm. You should definitely on this topic, you, David Gardner's here. You ought, okay. to, you ought to interview David Gardner. Yeah, I will. Because uh, I, I, let me give an example. You know, now the COVID messed it all up because we don't mm -hmm. do, most of the board meetings are remote now. Mm -hmm. But when, before COVID, we could go into a meeting. And so, so you, you'd have the dinner before the board meeting and then you'd come to the board meeting. And then one of the first things they do when you walk into the office is they'd hand you an envelope. And in the envelope was your top secret mission and uh, where they're asking you to go do something. Mm -hmm. And in my, in my case, they might ask me to, to go talk to the venture capital team. And, uh, or they might ask me to um, uh, talk or, or go to, you know, meeting with some part of the organization and, uh, and they, the organization take so advantage of what I know and my yeah. wisdom. It was a I, legitimate business request. Yes, exactly. Huh. But then, but, I f but I'm separated from the rest of the board doing it and everybody's got their own top secret assignment. Hmm. And we'd come back together and share what we learned from that experience. Wow. And, and also what we saw about the organization. Uh, one time I came in and my top secret mission was to go play a board game with Tom and David Gardner. <laughs> that is so funny. And, and so then, and then, and then at lunch, they would bring in like their, you'd get lunch and then they'd bring in their analysts, um, that make their stock recommendations. And then they would each have to pitch one stock and there'd be like four pitches. Hmm. And then the board would vote on who gave the best pitch. And, so, and that would be declared the winner in that game. Man. What I did, they all made good pitches. Yeah. And I'd write down the stocks they recommended and then I'd go out and buy them after the, after the meeting. Wow. So one day we just played Jeopardy with different parts of the organization and we had to you know, guess it. So the point I'm making is they made the entire board meeting yeah. fun. Huh. And, and it was fun and you learned and you, and you, and you loved being with the team and uh, uh, they're very inspiring. I don't know yeah. an organization that has adopted a more playful and that's i think due to tom and david's unique wow uh, characters they're they're both characters yeah there's so many things about love sack that i'm proud of and and the culture we build i think is really strong and special and unique and fun and guess what that culture is a reflection of you uh well you know it is maybe but but you probably. like it or not it is sure good warts and beauty marks <laughs> okay <both>. fair <laughs> But man, our board meetings suck compared to that. I've got to get on my game. That's such a great challenge. Thank you for sharing that. That well, I wish I'd known that back. You know, I I haven't been on that board. Uh, I'd only been on the board a couple of years before Amazon bought Whole Foods. Yeah. So otherwise, I could have adopted some of those with our board. But I did adopt one thing in our What's board that? that made a huge difference. You could do this one. You know, for a long time, Whole Foods would end all of its management meetings with appreciations. Yeah. And uh, that's transformative. I always tell people, how can we create more love in our company? I say, if you do this one thing, you'll have more love in the company. Just yeah. end your meetings with appreciations, yeah. voluntary. And I started doing it with the board. Hmm. And it completely transformed the relationship with the board. Love it. The board was doing appreciations of each other and of the management team. And I never lost a director after that. You explain it in the book, Conscious Capitalism, with, with, better, you know, with, with more detail. but take you know, 15, 20 seconds and explain what appreciations are to those who haven't read the book. Appreciations are a way to end a meeting. You can do appreciations 
at any time, but we would do them at the conclusion of a meeting. And they're voluntary, so you don't have to do it. Basically, you just decide if you want to appreciate someone. Maybe just thank them. They yeah. did a special favor for you, or maybe they did something that was really good for the organization, yeah. and you wanted to call them out on that and appreciate them. And appreciations, particularly meetings, can be they can be long and they can be boring. Yeah. And oftentimes during a meeting, you're sitting there, your little ego sitting there judging other people, thinking, <laughs> wow, that was stupid. God, <laughs> everybody knows that. That's obvious. And and they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. Would you shut up? You just blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so you, you have all these little judgments going on. Uh-huh. But then if you end with appreciations, you you so, someone you've had a judgment about uh, gives this very authentic appreciation of you. You, sit, you say to yourself, you know, I think maybe I misjudged Larry. Oh, man. <laughs> It's got to be authentic, yeah. Because we course. know we know the difference mm-hmm. between somebody who's who's trying to flatter us and somebody who's actually really authentically appreciating us. Yeah. And then the biggest benefit in appreciations, though, is not to receive the appreciation, but to give the appreciation. Yeah. Because when you do an authentic appreciation, you cannot do it without opening your heart. Yeah. In other words, an appreciation is a an act of sharing love. Yes. If it's authentic, yes. and so. When you open your heart, it doesn't just close back up again. It stays yeah. open. So appreciations has this amazing effect of connecting people and opening the heart space for more love to be shared in the group. Yeah, let me let me build on that. I, I wouldn't normally share this, but I know that you know you're a very uh, spiritual person, a person who's open to you know these types of things. I, I once, uh, as, as probably silly as this might sound to some, you know, I, I once. Uh, was asked to give a talk in church, and I and I and this speech I wrote um, was called "Service Begets Love," and it occurred to me after various you know pieces of study and other things that you know we feel like if I do something for someone like you know we I want this it. reciprocation, but actually, when you do something for someone, it is you, the doer, you know, who's doing the service, and and an appreciation is is it's very similar. It's service, you know, you're, you're doing someone Same some, thing. a kindness and it's you who is engendered with love. Yes. Not the other, the other person may or may not even accept it or appreciate it if they're in the wrong headspace or the wrong ego space. And man, that to me was a huge unlock for life. That well, when, you, you know, yeah. the four languages of love book, mm-hmm. one of the, one of the, one of the acts, one of the uh, languages of love is acts of service. Yeah. That happens to be one of my mm love languages that I give to other people. I do services for them. Mm. And uh, that's the main way I share. Sh- sh- I, I do words of appreciation as well. That's another another act. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. But they're very similar. Yeah, they're cousins. Because when you do an act of service, if it's not a duty, if you're not doing it out of duty or a sense of I have to do this, but you're doing it because you genuinely want to, then to do that act of service is to open your heart. And you are, it is a, it's a love language. That's right. And so it, it, it opens love. Yeah. And you're right. The other person may or may not receive it, may yes. not appreciate it, but your intention was there. And so yeah. the heart opened. It's very powerful. It's actually, a, you know, I often tell people that are, um, that are depressed. Mm-hmm. And I say, you know, one thing I've learned about how to get out of depression <laughs> is a contraction. And what we need to do is you've got to get you more expansive. You need to volunteer someplace. Mm-hmm. You, if you start doing services for other people, yes. one thing you're going to discover is a lot of people are a lot worse off than you are, and you stop yeah. feeling sorry for yourself. But the very act of doing the service is expansive, yes. expands your consciousness, opens the heart, takes you out of depression. Yes. So um, I, volunteer work is actually a cure for depression. Life By the way, that's one reason psychedelic therapy is very powerful hmm. for people that are terminally ill or depressed because it expands the consciousness and people look around and say, whoa, this universe is incredible. It's so mm-hmm. beautiful. Oh my God, we're alive. Gets them Sean, we're alive. Isn't that incredible? Beyond my God. Themselves. Yeah. Pretty, pretty hard to be depressed when you, uh, <laughs> when you when understand you're, your when place you're, when you're universe. serving others and appreciating others. Yeah. Wow. Well, you've, you've done me a service by, by being here, our listeners. I mean, your time and your wisdom, uh, so valuable. So, so to, to wrap it up, any, you know, in the spirit of let me save you 25 years, any, any piece of advice come to mind, uh, you know, the way you might have saved yourself a chunk of your 
long journey had you only known then what you know now or what you might advice you might give to your younger self or someone else beginning on their 25 year march you know i get asked that question a lot so i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna give you maybe sure. two or three different answers to Please. it the first answer i give is what could i tell my younger self and i and i'd say do not go out with her <laughs> <laughs> You're, okay. You're, you're headed for years of misery. Box checked. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Brutal honesty. Yes. Uh, okay. Number two, then I, I, I would say, you know, maybe uh, that acquisition, John, you should have backed away from. Don't do that one. Or don't hire that person. Right? So, because, so far, two don'ts. Well, yes. I mean, because. Two don'ts. Well, they're saving yourself from mistakes. Mm -hmm. Mistakes are always something that you did. How might you have, how might you have recognized them, John? Or did you always know wait, in your heart? But did here's, you know? But here's the okay. most important thing. Okay. The third answer is actually the correct answer and All the right. true answer. I wouldn't. Oh, the, 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 there's four answers. The third answer is it wouldn't matter what I told my younger self. He'd have told me to go screw you off. You've done it man. anyway. You don't know what you're you talking gotta about. You've got to learn it for myself. That's one thing I But that about. leads to the fourth one, okay. which is I wouldn't change, I wouldn't tell my younger self anything because I needed to make all the mistakes that I've made to become the person that I am today. If I hadn't made those mistakes, hubris, you know, I mean, you need to sometimes get your face rammed into the dirt because it teaches you some humility. It teaches you that you do make mistakes, helps you be more compassionate to other people's yeah. failings. If you don't ever fail yourself, then you, you tend to be judgmental of others. And why aren't they so great? So at the end of the day, it's worked out really well for me. So I don't know if I'd want to mess with, the, with that formula. I answer. like the man I am today. And because I had to, of the mistakes. because of the mistakes. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So let me unpack this with you live at the risk of, you know, setting it not my entire book because I've reflected on this actually in mistakes and miracles mistakes less miracles and lessons from the love sack story and I believe the same thing as you that sadly I would not have learned the things I need to learn had I not made those costly painful mistakes so on the other hand I wrote a book that is meant to help others right avoid it's totally uh, different so, so tell me the value in that. Tell, how do you reconcile that? The difference is, is that if they internalize your lessons, mm -hmm. they don't have to have their face slammed into the dirt. <laughs> okay. They learn the lesson. They learn the lesson. That's the idea. Mm. They learn the lesson, but without the pain. Mm. And um, so that's, that's an act of service. Or perhaps... They won't have to learn those lessons, but there are plenty of other mistakes they're going to make anyway. They're going to so make plenty of mistakes despite smoke. your book. <laughs> <laughs> You're doomed no matter what. No, but uh, still, it's, it's, it, you are saving them 25 years. That's mm -hmm. the point. You're mm -hmm. helping them. And you're ex think of yourself also as maybe an, acceler an accelerant. Mm -hmm. You're helping accelerate their what progress. They, yeah, what they might accomplish. Like that's, that's true. Like The truth is, love sack... I'll be really frank about this. Love Sack didn't need to take this long to get to where we are. Had I done a few things differently and frankly been humble enough to learn these lessons and have mentors along the way, I could have gotten to where I am now. And where I am now gives me the chance to do it, I think, another 25. So I, instead, you know, I might have been able to compress what could be accomplished in 75 down into 50 or in 50 down into 25. And that, that is, I think, a legitimate... Um, math to be done all right so i'm going to contradict everything i've just said okay. and i will i will give you the uh, the one thing okay. i would i would go back and tell myself when we coming out of that 2008 recession mm -hmm. and whole foods market <coughs> stock price <coughs> had dropped 90 percent you could have bought our company out of, with our own cash flow and paid for it in just three years yeah and uh uh we came out of that and our and our and our stock price just kept going up. We, re we regained everything we had and went up to new highs. We went, went up, you know, we went and became incredibly valuable. We became the most valuable food retailer in the United States yeah. that was pure play food retailer. Only Walmart and Costco were worth more than Whole Foods back wow. in like 2013. Wow. What I wish I'd told myself, because those five years was the great, greatest run for us. John, drop your prices. This is your opportunity. You'll never have this opportunity again. Hmm. Your stock won't go up as much, but you can get your prices down. And it's so hard to, we, when we end up selling to Amazon, we needed to lower our prices. I just didn't know how to do it. 
because in the short run we had those activists, mm -hmm. shareholder activists, and it was like if we lowered our prices, if you sell something for a dollar and you start selling it for 90 cents, the first thing that happens is your same store sales plummet, yeah. your sales plummet, and your profits go way down. And then with the lag period, customers begin to think, you know, it's a much more affordable place. I'm going to do more shopping here. And in the long run, you get it back and then some. Yeah. Well, we just didn't have the time to do it by the time the activists were trying to take over our company and we sold to Amazon. If we'd done it from 2008, Whole Foods would probably be, still be independent today. Hmm. So that's, that's a lesson I had to learn a very painful, hard way, and ultimately it resulted in the sale of the company to Amazon. Yeah. That's been a good thing in some ways, but if you gave yeah. me a choice, I'd rather be independent. But the, and, and it's interesting because the arc of what drove your, the value of the organization you built to the highest highs, you had to essentially, as you just described, if I can put it crassly, eat your own young. You had to be willing to, to change one of the defining features of what had made you so valuable. And that's very hard for any business or business leader to do, you know. It's not like we would have been the cheapest supermarket out there. Sure. We would have just been more competitive. Yeah. And uh, uh, people would have, the whole paycheck narrative didn't have to be there. Could, could you have recognized that though in real time, John? Or, or could you only now see that with the benefit of hindsight? Really? Well, the you answer know? that's a fair question, and the answer is, of course, I could have seen it. Uh, I didn't want to see it, hmm. and uh, because as what I did, what was happening was that as our um, as our stock rose up, our our gross profit margins were getting higher. We were getting uh, higher overall gross profit uh, margins as a percentage, and that didn't seem normal to me. I said I kept asking the team, hmm. I said, I don't. This doesn't make sense. How come, our, how come we're getting higher gross profit margins? Our sales are going up, but why are we getting, and, they, and the answer they gave me was, well, we're getting part of it on the buy side. We're buying things cheaper because we're bigger now. Mm -hmm. And the second way we're doing it is with higher sales, we have less spoilage. Mm -hmm. So we're, you know, and here's the thing. It's not that those weren't true. They were both true, but that wasn't the main reason. The main reason was they were raising prices. Uh -huh. And I didn't take the next step to prove what they told me was true. Yeah. And I think because I was happy the stock was going up, and at some level I probably just didn't want to know. Because mm -hmm. it, you know, our comps were It was were good really, news. Yeah, it was good news. Our comps were really strong. We didn't have uh, every, every supermarket company trying to undercut us in price yeah. and, and get our products and undercut us in price. That happened. Yeah. And, but it wasn't happening back in 2008. Yeah. That was our opportunity. And I, at that time, I was more concerned about Trader Joe's than I was about the supermarkets. Yeah. I said, we can't let Trader Joe's keep underpricing us. We need, to, we need to match them. So what's interesting is, if I can translate what you're saying into just broader principles, maybe, you tell me if I got this wrong, but in a way, you were caught taking too much. Like, had you given a bit back, you know, it would have, it would have hurt your stock quite price. that way. Yeah, but, but yeah. if we had been, um, if we'd been a little bit more long-term oriented, uh -huh. we'd been thinking about where we wanted the company to be 10 years later. Yeah. We would have thought, well, we know we're going to have to lower prices. Mm -hmm. Let's do it now while we can, mm -hmm. because our stock price is going up. There you go. That, that, so that's the 2020 hindsight uh -huh. was seeing the whole story play out. And it was like, this was yeah. the point where we had the best opportunity that's why I would go back to 2008 okay. and tell my younger, younger self, cut your prices huh. or else you're going to regret it. So that, that leads us to another Seanism for another podcast of a different day. Keep one hand on the now and one hand on the next because we've all learned those painful lessons in a similar way. That's a, it's a great, great slogan. That'll, that'll be one of my takeaways from our conversation today. Mm. Keep one hand on the net now and one hand on the next. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I failed to do that, either, either hand. Mm -hmm. you're in trouble. You're right. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Oh, John, thank you so much. John, another thing we have in common. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. I mean, that we could go down the list, I'm sure. I mean, that's the, that's the beauty of it. That's my point. You know, we can, you can be very different people, but connected by all these common threads when you, when you, you know, walk the same journey, essentially. Exactly. All right. Well, you can follow John as I do on social media, on Instagram at simply I am John Mackey, that's M-A-C-K-E-Y, spelled out. Please check out the Whole Planet Foundation where their mission is to alleviate poverty around the globe. Donate and participate there. Check out Love Life. Um, Love that life. For now, just in California, but expanding out, right? Uh, uh, or, 
Well, we have a telehealth business. Okay. So just if you go to our website, love. Love.life. Love.life, you'll see we have a telehealth business. We have a coaching business. Perfect. Those are both online. Perfect. Mastering diabetes, mastering weight loss, and a telehealth medical system. But the first physical location opens in LA, El Segundo area in uh, June of 2024. Okay, I will be checking it out when I'm out there. Please don't forget to like this podcast or video. Please subscribe to it. Do share it on social media and help others to maybe save a chunk off their own 25 year <laughs> journey because you're just that good of a friend. Thank you so much to the Oracle of Organic, the captain of consciousness, the band leader of business done the right way, who is still leading and growing and learning himself after all these decades. What an example. Thank you so much, Mr. John Mackey. Thank you, Sean. It's been, it's been a pleasure. It's been fun. It's been fun. And to everyone listening, remember, play along the way or you might just wake up in 25 years and have just gotten old. Grateful to be with you. Bye.